Good evening and welcome, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here at LMU this evening. This event is also being live streamed, so we'd like to also extend a welcome to those of you who are not pr physically present, but present with us online this night. I've been asked to make a brief reminder that I'm sure you all know is coming to please silence your cell phones out of respect for our speakers. My name is Layla Karst. I'm an assistant professor here at Loyola Marymount in Theological <laughs> Studies. This is our seventh annual Mary Milligan Lecture, a lecture series that started in 2013 to create a forum for critical reflection and spirituality in service to the church, to the academy, and to the world, and in keeping with the charism of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary that all may have life and have it to the full. It's also in memory of Sister Mary Milligan and her own work in service to the church, to the world, and to the academy, including her many years here at LMU as a professor of theological studies, as our provost, and then as our dean. We're especially grateful to the RSHM community for this endowed lecture that gives us an opportunity to reflect on work and spirituality in a wide audience and in light of many contemporary issues. I thought before we start, I might say something briefly about how spirituality and our reflection on spiritual practices is especially important for our church and our world today. But I worry that kind of statement may be a little misleading. Spiritual practices have long and always sustained our communities and our world. They brought us courage in the midst of fear, inspired hope in the midst of despair, given life in the midst of brokenness, and bound us together with one another, with our world, and with our God. In our present context, so frequently marked by narratives of religious disaffiliation, it can be easy to sing a tune of religious and spiritual decline. And yet at least one recent study of US Catholics found that while attendance at mass on Sunday has on average been declining, the frequency with which Catholics report praying on a daily basis has remained constant over the last 40 years. <coughs> to me, this suggests not so much a need for a lament for a religion in decline, but rather an anticipation and a spirit of curiosity that seeks to discover the ways our faith is still blooming, albeit in unexpected places. It's an invitation to watch and listen to discern and to discover the way that God and God's people are once again making all things new. In his encyclical Evangelicarium, The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis writes of spiritual practices and piety as an ongoing development of the faith that we share. They're inspired, he tells us, and guided by the Holy Spirit, and they add content to our common Christian tradition content that arises especially from the life of faith lived on the margins of our society and our church and from the people who are privileged bearers of God's good news to the world. I'm grateful for our speaker tonight who will invite us into some of these spaces and offer us new eyes with which to see. We do have one small task before we invite our speaker up. As Lady Gaga has recently reminded us, picture-perfect moments and seemingly spontaneous chemistry don't just happen. <laughs> they require a lot of practice and planning and preparation ahead of time, as well as the hard work of many people you won't see on this stage tonight. Four of my colleagues in theological studies have worked tirelessly over many months to bring us all here tonight. These are the members of the Milligan Lecture Planning Committee, Karen Enriquez, Douglas Christie, Michael Haran, and Faith Sevilla. These colleagues hold the institutional wisdom needed to make planning an event like this look easy, and the energy and good humor to bring tonight's event to fruition when it inevitably turns out not to be as easy as it looks. <laughs> so on behalf of my colleagues of the planning committee, I would like to especially thank Sister Joan Tracy, who is one of our LMU trustees, as well as the Provincial Superior for the Western American Province of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary. We're also delighted to be joined all the way from Rome tonight by Sister Ros Rosamond Blanchett, I practiced, the General Superior of the Religious Heart of Mary. To you both and to all the RSHM sisters who are here with us this evening, welcome. 
and thank you for your continued support in making this lecture series possible year after year. I'd also like to acknowledge Sister Mary Milligan's family, who are also joining us tonight. Can you please stand up so we can thank you for your support as well? Thank you as well to all of the donors who are here this evening who helped to make this event and events like this possible. Thanks are due as well to the hard work of our colleagues here at LMU. Thanks to Donna Gray, the Development Officer at the Bellman College for Liberal Arts. Thank you for your support, your hard work, and for continuing to help us build and maintain relationship with donors who support events like this one tonight. To the events management staff who transform both our lecture and reception spaces and make sure that after our hearts and our heads are fed, we might also feed our bodies. Thanks too to our grad assistants who have been welcoming all of us outside and assisting with this event throughout the day. Thanks to the Marymount Institute and our colleagues Terezia de Vroom, to Sarah Martinez who designed the beautiful artwork for our posters and publication, to Elias Wandemu, and to the Marymount Institute Press and to Sai Publishers who have produced and printed Dr. Bingamer's lecture in a volume for this evening. Thanks to the Theological Studies faculty and students who are here tonight supporting this event. I see many of you out there. I'd also like to thank the BCLA Dean's Office, our Dean Robin Crabtree and our Associate Dean Jonathan Rothschild for their continued support of this series. And last but certainly not least, we'd like to thank President Timothy Lassnider, who's here with us tonight and will in just a few minutes introduce our speaker for the evening. The 16th President of Loyola Marymount University President Snyder has been a distinguished professor and administrator at Jesuit universities for more than 30 years. Under President Snyder's leadership, LMU envisions itself as the definitive center for global imagination. Guided by the university's mission, he continues to challenge all of us at LMU to leverage our creativity and to develop new opportunities for interdisciplinarity and innovation. Friends, colleagues, and guests, please join me in welcoming President Professor Timothy Lassnider. Thank you, Professor Karst. Can you tell, Professor Karst's students are very lucky, <laughs> right? It's just to be that natural and, and welcoming to each of us. We really appreciate that, and thank you. I don't know whose idea this was, this is religious incline. This was an amazing way to start that we had that beautiful music. I thought maybe we were going to be doing a Zen gig here, but I think it's more of a, it's going to be more of a Catholic gig. Uh, my gratitude, I, I joined Professor Karst in gratitude. And it goes out first to our Department of Theological Studies, our fabulous department. Could all persons associated with that department, faculty and students, please rise for a round of applause. Thank you for being with us. We thank also the Marymount Institute for producing the accompanying volume that of uh, this ever important lecture series. And this has gone on every year and we're really honored to have the press and the Marymount Institute with us. And I joined Professor Carson welcoming all the way from Rome, the wonderful sister Rosamund Blanchett, who the general superior of the religious of Sacred Heart of Mary. And thank you, Sister, we, we say Sister Rose in my remarks. Well, how, how do they say it in Italy? Roz. It's Roz. Okay, well, that's what I thought. When it's R-O-Z, it should be Roz. So I thank you, Sister Roz, for gracing us this evening. And I'm delighted also to welcome Sister Joan Tracy, who, as you know, is the Provincial Superior of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, for her leadership and guidance associated with this talk but also for her work as a trustee. And this will be, I think by the end of the day, we will have spent about five or six hours together. So I really I appreciate her patience and putting up with, with my presence. <laughs> I, I thank all members of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary who are with us. And also the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. And I think we have quite a few from what I can see here. And I thank each of you for your creative and your spiritual sustenance 
of our institution. I like to tell our Jesuit competitors, colleagues, sorry, <laughs> that we are simply more powerful in effecting our mission because of the presence of our sisters. And as I told the Jesuits in my first meeting with them, we have doubled the genders of all those other places except for maybe Detroit, Mich uh, Detroit Mercy. So we have something that others don't have. We better represent humankind past and present and future and all things associated with creating the world in which we want to live. So I thank each of you who are with us. I thank the, the, the Milligan family who are with us as well. It's good to see you again. The Mary Milligan Endowed Lecture in Spirituality connects us to our heritage and to the traditions that continue to invigorate our community. Our love for humanity, our love for the earth, our love for the creative pulse are indeed central to the RSHM charism, giving and receiving life. And of course that infuses tonight's discussion. The Milligan Lecture asks us to reflect upon spirituality in service of the church and the world. And as we do so, we are emboldened to see and experience our surroundings, as Professor Karst noted, with fresh eyes, including how God's love presents itself to us in mysterious ways that open our minds and open our hearts to the boundless possibilities associated with the human future and the Earth's future as, as its accompaniment. Be it through our scholarship, which is quite powerful in this department, or our teaching, which is quite powerful in this department, transformative, or through our daily interactions, each of us has the potential to be change makers, to be innovators, to be empaths, and to be revolutionaries. With her lecture, Love of God, Love of Justice, the cases of Dorothy Day and Simone Weil, Professor Maria Clara Bingamer explores the activism and spirituality of two revolutionary mystics. So similar to Sister Milligan, Dorothy Day and Simone Weil championed a faith that does justice, and they lived authentically with a sense that God is within us and God is among us. And Professor Bingamer will shortly take us on a journey illuminating how God and justice are interwoven into the lives of these two trailblazing women who, exemplifying their philosophy, th sought tirelessly to eradicate injustices. Day and Vey's commitment to those on the margins expanded their perspectives and it expanded their hearts. Their stories demonstrate that the path to justice is paved with action with truth and with collaboration. So with this as background, I am delighted to introduce the creator of this transformative work that we're going to learn about. Maria Clara Bingamer is a, is a Brazilian theologian and <coughs> academic at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, where she is a professor of theology and has served as the Dean of the Center of Theology and Human Sciences. Her work focuses on systematic theology, and in particular on contemporary mysticism and Latin American and liberation theology. Professor Bingamer is widely published in several languages. Her, I'll just give you some of, her, some of her English works. They include A Faith for God, Reflections on Trinitarian Theology for Our Times, Witnessing, Prophecy, Politics, and Wisdom, and Mary, Mother of God, Mother of the Poor. More recently, she published Simone Weil, A Mystic with Passion and Compassion, The Mystery and the World, and Latin American Theology, Roots and Branches. Bingamer held the first Duffy Lectures Chair at Boston College in spring 2015, and she serves on the editorial boards of many theological journals, including Concilium. And we were so dazzled by Professor Bingham's erudition and commitment to justice during LMU's recent, and I'm gonna say recent because we had an argument, Father Deck thought it was last year, 
And um, the Professor Bingamer thought it was the year before, so it was the year before. It was a, <laughs> Alan. It was a Latino theology and ministry lecture, and she was so dazzling that we decided to bring her back this year for the 2019 Mary Milligan RSHM Lecture in Spirituality. Please join me in welcoming Professor Maria Clara Bingamer to LMU. everybody. <laughs> it's an honor and a joy to be here again in this university. And um, I thank a lot the invitation and um, am glad also to be able to, to present you those two female figures that I think are so important for the church today. I begin with a quote of David Tracy in the book Mystics, Presence and Aporia. I quote, like Simone Weil, I prefer to begin thinking about our awareness of God with an account of human and historical awareness of innocent suffering. What Weil suggests, though she never says so explicitly, is that one can begin mysticism with a tragic sense of innocent suffering." End of quote. When we think about the 20th century, we think of the peak of the process of secularization, the disappearance of religion, or simply of a century without God. Nevertheless, the so-called century without God is not empty of God's presence. Perhaps that presence is manifest and made visible in a different way. The medieval world and the beginning of modern times were shaped by a culture and civilization that was Christian. Yet, in a century without God, in a secular age, where God's traces are almost invisible and where religion seems to take a nebulous and rather vague form, mystical experiences continue to happen, strongly and unexpectedly, to be sure, but with a different character. Mystics are no longer found mainly within cloisters or religious orders. We can meet them in factories in the middle of the noisy and stressful rhythm of machines and industry, or in the streets with the poorest and most bereft victims of the so-called progress, or in prison due to their activity and commitment considered dangerous by established authorities, or in the hell of the many formed gulags that fill our world this is to say, in very secular situations. What tells us that they are mystics and not merely political activists, ethical and honest people who commit to the most important of humankind of of humankind's struggles? Although the goals can be the same, since the same struggles can be fought by believers of any tradition as well as by non-believers, the sign of the mystical experience is the love of God. That love whose awareness moves and changes lives is the reason for these mystics to be where they are and not elsewhere, in spite of their own weakness, fragility, and unworthiness. Their lives, their words are valuable sources for theology to read and think about. And that can also be perhaps a way to help our contemporaries to rediscover the sense of life for which they are thirsty which is certainly not to be found either in frenetic consumerism and superficial and volatile sensations, nor in weak and provisional affective relationships. Besides this love for God, those mystics experience and leave a profound love for justice. For them, mysticism and ethics are inseparable because faith and justice go together, hand in hand, as it is in the Bible. In both the Jewish and Christian scriptures, justice is fundamentally about right and good relationships. 
The scriptures describe conditions, material, emotional, and spiritual, in which people flourish in right relationships with God and with each other. When something damages or ruptures those relationships, doing justice involves setting things right. In both senses, justice involves integrity, wholeness, and flourishing for people and their relationships. Throughout the sacred scriptures, justice goes together with faith and religious practice. In the same way that injustice goes together with idolatry, justice is compatible with loving and praising the true God and not idols. In this reflection, I will explore how these two terms, God and justice, become visible in two women's lives. These women of the 20th century reached Christian faith after crossing the desert of atheism. The experiences of Dorothy Day and Simone Weil can enlighten our understanding of spirituality for today. Their spiritual life, bonded together with their commitment to the poor and the victims of injustice, provides a powerful insight for both Christian lives in the First World, the US, Europe, and for the Global South, where poverty and oppression are an always deeply sad reality. What I intend to demonstrate is that, in spite of being unusual and unique in many aspects, these two women were intensely inspired and spiritually moved by God, and also tormented by compassion all through their lives. Significantly, they were both adult converts. The attention to the suffering of others precedes their conversion and continue to play a central role in the spirituality they developed following their explicit encounter with the revealed God. I begin to present the art today. What strikes us the most in the effort of realizing a theological reading of Dorothy Day's biography is the enormous sensitivity of this woman, apparently not so different from many others. Day was a woman who loved and was loved, who dreamed of the home and children, she also worked and made a living with effort and pain. Nevertheless, when Dorothy Day speaks about herself, her sensitivity becomes immediately evident to the reader. Here is someone with all potentialities open and vigilant, someone who allows herself to be deeply touched by the world around her and by other people. This makes her an open channel, ready to be deeply touched by God and to surrender her life to God from that moment on. Dorothy Day always had this very deep and evident sensitivity in her body experience. Happily aware of her feminine being, she was also very conscious of her own body. During her youth, she fell in love more than once and enjoyed being with people of the other sex, loving tenderness, loving to love and to be loved. She was happy to feel others close to them, to her. It was this wakefulness to herself as embodied that painted her, making her feel diminished and deeply hurt during her first serious relationship with the journalist Lionel Muiz. Her pregnancy and the abortion she felt compelled to have in order to save their relationship was a very hard experience. The subsequent failure of the relationship and the indelible scars the abortion left on her sensitive body were determinant to her human and spiritual evolution. The most gratifying human and concrete experience of Dorothy's life after that was motherhood. After the abortion, she believed herself to be barren for life, unable to conceive another child. But then Tamar Teresa came and was born her daughter with Forster Betterham, a botanic which, with whom she had a stable relationship. And she experienced the greatest happiness of her life. They felt that the way to best express her immense gratitude to be able to conceive a child was to baptize her daughter in the Catholic Church. I quote her, I didn't want my daughter to flounder in life, as I myself so many times floundered and stumbled. I wanted to believe and wanted my daughter to believe. And if belonging to a church could give her such an invaluable grace as faith in God and the loving company of saints, then the thing to do was to baptize her as Catholic." End of quote. Tamar Teresa then was baptized before her mother. 
Dorothy herself was not baptized till after a painful and difficult definitive break with Forster Batterham, due to the religious abyss that had opened between them, mostly after Tamar Teresa's birth. The decision to baptize her daughter and to embrace the Catholic faith was enormously costly for Dorothy, resulting in the end of her relationship with her beloved companion and the loss of many friends. To have, then, this feminine body inhabited by desires accustomed to tremble with pleasure under the caresses of a beloved partner, a body with engendered, gave birth and nourished the beloved daughter, who was to be the light of her life from then on, sealed Dorothy's destiny. From that moment, her embodied life was one of loneliness and the weight of struggling as a layperson and a celibate mother in a sexist society and within a male-dominant church. Nevertheless, it was this same body that trembled in compassion and solidarity with all poor and unhappy people who crossed her path and allowed her to experience as her own the pains of the world and humankind. This closeness and integral affinity of body and soul with the poor was a central part of her aesthetic sensitivity. During her youth, while Dorothy Day lived in her hometown, Chicago, she already manifested contemplative features in her personality. For instance, one of her biographers, Jim Forrest, observed, I quote, she has the gift to find beauty in the middle of urban desolation. Monotonous streets were transformed by pungent smells. Geranium and tomato, plantings, garlic, olive oil, coffee roasting, bread and cakes on bakery ovens, end of quote. Here, she said, there was enough beauty to satisfy me. Later, when leaving with Forza Batterham on Satan Island, this aesthetic sensitivity opened itself to the mis mysteries and revelations of nature, he was botanic. Guided by her partner, she learned to discover beauty far from big cities, in sunrise and sunset, the seas murmur, plants and animals, shells and mollusks. Nevertheless, all this natural beauty did not minimize the centrality of human beings. Forza presence and her love for him were certainly the lens through which she became capable of reading the new world of creation discovered, and through him to find God's presence as the origin and possibility of all existence. From her early childhood, Day was also passionate about the fundamental quality of literature. Readings made during her youth very much influenced her life after conversion. The way she could connect literary and biblical texts or the testimonial narratives of great mystics shows a refined sensitivity towards literary creation. In this way, they learned to immerse herself ever more radically in her option of love and service to the poor. After meeting with Peter Morin, French disciple of Emmanuel Mounier, and under his guiding hand, they added new texts to her reading materials that emphasized Catholic social teaching. Thomas Aquinas, Jacques Marie, Jacques Maritain, Belloc, Chesterton, Jill, and McNabb became accustomed readings for her. First captivated by Maurice Vi Warren's vision and later making her own cognitive synthesis, they was able to give definitive form to her vocation, centered on her two great loves, God and the poor, God and justice. Day's sensibilities then, so vital, personal, and attentive to all expressions of beauty, were opened and consequently deeply touched by the social injustice she saw all around, becoming a social sensitivity. The wounds provoked in her by the injustice she saw led her to a response that was not merely rational or intellectual, but embodied through her loving closeness to those affected by injustice with whom they identified herself increasingly as manifesting the presence of God. This was also a transforming sensitivity, constituted as a deep desire to change the situation of those who suffered injustice. While living in Chicago as a teenager, they started reading books that moved her social conscience and her sense for justice. Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, was very inspiring for her. And like the books of social injustice by Dickens and Victor Hugo, authors she read abundantly, this one, this one was a story situated in present times. 
The novel's location was not Europe, but her own Chicago's stockyards and slaughterhouses. Sinclair's hero was a Lithuanian immigrant, the only family member who wasn't completely destroyed by misery and injustice. Finally, he commits himself to struggle for a just social order, becoming a member of the Socialist Party. That novel touched Day's heart, and she began to take long walks in the poor neighborhoods of South Chicago. It was the beginning of an attraction that would last till the end of her life. I quote her, I walked kilometers exploring gray streets, fascinating in their dark sadness, sameness, passing tavern after tavern, where I imagined scenes such as the feast of the Polish wedding of Sinclair's story, end of quote. Doing this, she had a vivid sense of who she should be, a kind of premonition of her own vocation, understood as inseparable from the life of God's beloved, the poor. And I quote, from that moment on, my life should be connected to theirs. Their interests should be mine. I had received the call, a vocation, a direction in life." End of quote. Compassion for the other, the one who suffers, begin to be the center of her identity. As a young adult, ex as a young adult experiencing jail for the first time, she writes, and I quote, when I wrote for the first time these experiences, I wrote even more strongly about my identification with those who surrounded me. I was this mother whose daughter was raped and murdered. I was the mother who gave birth to the monster who did that. I was that same monster, feeling in my own womb each abomination." End of quote. This tells us a lot about the feeling of belonging which is an identifying seal of her mysticism, to feel at ease among the least of the earth, to feel that where the poor are, there would be her place, there she should be. It is always clear to her that it is necessary to be with the poor, struggling unceasingly against poverty. For her, it was abundantly clear that charity, understood as only giving alms, was not enough. It was not enough to assist the victims of social injustice. It was necessary to go beyond and work to undo the causes of those injustices. For her, this was the path to holiness. She says, and I quote, where are the saints in order to transform social order? Not only to be religious ministers to slaves, but to finish with slavery, end of quote. These reflections multiply through all her writings and show her as a pioneer of movements that would emerge only later in the institutional church. The identification of social sin and the need for structural solutions instead of simply palliative and fragmented ones is very present, for instance, in the liberation theology of the Latin American church of the 70s. And their understanding of Christianity is attuned with it beyond her critique of some Marxist elements presents in this theology. Her social sensitivity then was also an inseparably a deep spiritual sensitivity. Dorothy Day really wanted to make a revolution, but a revolution that passed by the heart. Moreover, she believed that the only true revolution would be born from a converted heart touched by divine grace. This was her experience, and this was also the only experience she believed valid to transmit to those who came closer to her. At the Catholic Worker Movement, they lived a life of faithfulness to the revelation of scriptures, practicing voluntary and radical poverty, devoted to the works of mercy and the struggle for justice and peace. Besides her work on behalf of the poor and unhappy, she was also involved in the perpetual struggle for peace, Day's pacifism is one of the strongest characteristics of her commitment. She wrote important texts denouncing war in all forms and every mode of violence, which she understood as contradicting the gospel at its roots. To be an activist, but always finding her source in Jesus' gospel, this was Day's long life. She died at 80. She understood her actions as the fruit of God's action within her heart. In her book, From Union Square to Rome, addressed to her fellow communists from whom she grew apart 
after her conversion, but to whom she felt very close, she writes bravely, defending the primacy of the spiritual over the material. It's a long quote, but I think it's worth reading it. I felt this despair when I was there in jail for 15 days, contemplating the fundamental misery of human existence, a misery that would remain even if social justice was reached and the state of utopia would prevail. As it's not possible to walk on a cell floor with grids or lay on your back on a hard cot, looking a glimpse of sunlight traveling slowly, oh so slowly, through the cell, without realizing and be aware that till the heart and soul of humankind are transformed, there is no hope of happiness to us." End of quote. Dorothy Day's main struggles were for justice and peace. For this, she lived dying among the poor at Mary House in 1980. She completely trusted God's love for her and did not wallow in guilt over the mistakes of the past. Her non-Catholic, indeed non-Christian, early life experiences were a vital part of her mature adult spirituality. After her conversion to Catholicism, she often commented on the ongoing influence of her leftist past by quoting St. Augustine, the bottle always smells of the liquor it once held. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks to Dorothy Day, many Roman Catholics now know the power and indeed the religious use of tactics of nonviolent resistance and direct action in opposing injustice. Now, Simone Weil. Simone Weil had a childhood and youth very different from those of Dorothy Day. Her father was a physician and her family had a comfortable middle-class life in a good Parisian neighborhood. The Vels stimulated strongly the intellectual lives of both their children, André and Simone. From very young, André revealed exceptional intellectual gifts as a mathematician. He's considered the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. Simone was very bright too, but her health was always problematic. Although she remained a, a person of fragile health her whole life, this was not an obstacle to a rich and brilliant intellectual. After her effect, about her affective life, we have no stories of close or sexual relationships with men or desire to have a family or to be a mother. He was, she was lonely. In spite of that, Vail had many good friends and admirers. Some of them crossed her path when she was young. Others appeared in her adulthood. But all her capacity to love was turned completely towards the unfortunate who needed her care and attention, and later on to God, incarnated in Jesus Christ, who became the great passion of her life. Vale had her moments as an activist, but she was mainly an intellectual, and through her intellectual life, which was also contemplative, she reached the most important insights and received the challenges and commitments that gave sense to her life and even to her death. The passion for knowledge and for truth was the seal of her personality, together with the compassion for anyone who was suffering from any weakness and pain, be it physical, moral, or social. Exceptionally bright from the intellectual point of view, Vail became one of the highest, of the, one of the brightest students of the philosophy master Alain in the Sorbonne. However, in her intellectual knowledge was always joined with compassion for human suffering, solidarity, and openness to others. Her intellectual trajectory in philosophical studies was always configured by burning compassion, constantly putting together intellectual knowledge with political and practical commitment. Her intellectual thirst, lived and practiced with all seriousness and rigor, would unite to a passion for the world and for human beings through a heart deeply affected by everything that harmed or diminished human life. Already during her university studies, studies at the École Normale Supérieure, Veil felt the desire to be physically closer to workers in order to experience their living conditions and their manual <laughs> labor. This interior movement reached its climax during her year working at the factory. She felt then, in her thoughts and heart, the intuition of the tragedies of the history of humankind that touched her deeply. The interior process of Weil 
thus became connected with the interior reality of oppression and injustice of a world that victimizes millions of human beings. The truth, also passionately searched for by her, began to show its dark face. She committed herself to the struggles of the workers and together with other students created the school for them. This commitment cost her the loss of jobs and responsibilities on many occasions, but the compassion that dwelt inside her enlarged and grew to universal levels, even through all those difficulties. Her project of working in the factory implied a search for how to reconcile the kind of structures demanded by industrial society with the work conditions and lives of a free proletariat. This unanswered question arose for her in the heat of the factory, in, his, in her closeness to the suffering of the workers. While in the factory, the accumulated fatigue of weeks started to put her in a state where even thinking became impossible. As she describes the deplorable state in which she found herself, I quote, the exhaustion finishes by making me forget the true reasons of a time at the factory and makes almost invincible for me the strongest temptation of this life. No more thinking, only means of no more suffering. Mm -hmm. Only Saturday afternoon and Sunday memories and Sunday, only Saturday, only Saturday afternoon and Sunday, memories come to me, hints of ideas, end of quote. Reflecting on her experiences after leaving the factory by causes of, of health she had to live after one year. <coughs> Vail says that only the time spent of the, at the factory produced in her a deep transformation, not only of some ideas, but of her whole perspective on things. That is to say, the feeling of life itself. Nevertheless, it is from this experience, painful and tiring one, that she will extract her most lucid reflections on work, labor, and the overarching goals of modern ideologies, especially real socialism, to free the workers who live lives of captivity and slavery at the factory. In spite of this difficult period, Weil's thinking did not stop. Work, in order to be free and not slave labor, must be done in conditions that make thinking, invention, and evaluation possible. It is a whole reformation of work and its modern configuration that is her deep desire. On June 27, 1934, Vail writes in her diary something very important to the evolution of her vital intellectual and spiritual process. Climbing on the bus back home, she feels like a slave deprived of right and writes these piercing words. I quote, how can I, the slave, still climb on this bus use it paying my 12 cents the same way as any other person. What an extraordinary favor. If they forced me brutally to step down, I believe this would seem perfectly natural to me. Slavery made me lose completely the feeling of having rights. It seems to me a favor to have moments during which I don't have to suffer anything of human brutality. Those moments are like heavenly smiles, a gift of fortuity. Let's hope I will conserve this state of spirit so reasonable." End of quote. Although the conception of vocation and obedience in Vail during this period is more similar to other philosophical schools, namely Stoicism and Catarism and not to Christianity, we can't help but recognize in her attitude and position Elements very similar to those of the movement of God's canonic journey, when in the incarnation God enters and penetrates the depth of human affliction and sin as a way of realizing human salvation. In this sense, obedience experience as vocation will lead Simone Weil to live the most painful aspects of the mystery of incarnation up to the point when she declares that the, spirit of the, fact, uh, at the, the experience at the factory destroyed her youth and sealed her, in her indelibly forever with the burning iron of slavery. With this mark always present in her body and life, they will walk through deep spiritual experiences which will confirm her in the way of compassion. 
she experiences this time as a purifying through her interior mourning, which drastically changes her. She will end her time of the factory, understanding it as, a, as her purgative way. She is now ready for the powerful enlightenment that will prepare her to encounter the loving face of Christ. In a letter published in the beautiful book Waiting for God to the Dominican priest Perrin, Joseph Marie Perrin, her friend and confidant, Veil, faithful to her forma mentis, explains why she never searched for God. This is due, she says, to the firm belief that one can't reach God, God here below through thought and reason. Because of that, she had never searched for him so as not to encounter him and explain him falsely. Nevertheless, she also affirms that she always considered the only possible attitude for herself the Christian attitude. She says, I was born, grew up, and always remained under Christian inspiration. Without using theological or moral terms, Vail makes an important distinction. She lived as a Christian by attitudes and behavior, but did not use or employ Christian notions or concepts in theoretical terms, but instead more practical ones. Those conceptions converted into vital practice were present in her person since she had the consciousness of being human while others were imposed on her later. Veil tells Father Berrin that her conception of life was Christian and that is why she never thought about entering Christianity in an official way because she believed she was already there. To add to, his, to this life, which she thought was already Christian, the dogmas, the moral uh, prescriptions seem to her not necessary to adhere officially. And so, due to her radical way of being, she avoided going to the church, where, on the other hand, she would have liked it to be. At this point, Vail presents to Father Perrin the three main points of her journey towards the divine light and the culmination of the experience of being taken by Christ in loving union. Those three contacts with Catholicism, in her own words, counted really for her. The first one is a deep encounter with a culture and a religion that was not hers and opened up to a different universe. Prepared by the purification of her one year at the factory, she was illuminated by that experience. This encounter was in Portugal, at Povo do Varzim, a fishing village. Simone Weil was fragile after the experience of the factory, feeling the burden of slavery on her. And she writes, describing what she felt. I quote, being in that state of spirit and in a miserable physical condition, I entered the little Portuguese village, which was so miserable too, alone at night under the full moon, the exact day of the Saint Patroness feast, Our Lady of Sorrows. It was by the sea. The wives of the fishermen walked around the boats in procession, bringing candles and singing songs, surely very ancient, of a wrenching sadness. Nothing can give an idea of what that is. I never heard anything so pungent, except the songs of the Volga boatmen. There, I was suddenly sure that Christianity is par excellence the religion of slaves, that slaves cannot not adhere to it, and I among them. She takes the words of Nietzsche, <laughs> Christianity is the religion of slaves, but takes a diff completely different conclusion than Nietzsche. <laughs> she has to enter it because she's a slave too. The second encounter took place in Assisi in 1937. Vail traveled to Italy and the beauty of the country enchanted her. The contemplation of the beauty in front of her astonished eyes forces her to kneel in an attitude of adoration and reverence. She says, there, alone in the little Romanesque chapel of the 12th century of Santa Maria degli Angeli, overcome by the incomparable wonder of purity, where St. Francis knelt down many times, something stronger than me obliged me for the first time in my life to kneel down." End of quote. The third encounter happened at Solemn Benedictine Abbey in France during Holy Week of 1938. There we can observe that Simone Weil's spiritual journey is coherent and ascending. 
The third episode is marked, first of all, by her suffering with unbearable headaches, but is also sealed by the incomparable beauty of the Gregorian chant she heard, as in Assisi, the vision of the Romanesque beauty of the chapel. This moment includes the presence of the Passion of Christ, which unites both elements, suffering and beauty, and gives them their definitive and supernatural meaning. She says, I quote, this experience allowed me by analogy to understand better the possibility of loving the divine love through affliction. It is evident that during those liturgies, the thought of Christ's passion entered me once and for all." End of quote. Vell is ready there for the experience of mystical union, which will happen soon after. The poem Love of a British poet of 17th century, George Herbert, offered to her by a British Catholic will be the thing that will provoke this unitive experience. Vail reads it again and again during the headache crisis, and it is during one of those readings that she feels totally taken by Christ. She describes, frequently at the peak moment of the violent crisis of a headache, I exercised myself to recite it, applying there all my attention and adhering with all my soul to the tenderness it includes. I try to recite it only as a beautiful poem, but without being conscious of it, this recitation had the virtue of a prayer. And it was during one of those recitations that, as I already wrote to you, Christ personally came down and took me." End of quote. The absolute novelty of this is that it is no longer a question of contacts with Catholicism but of a real contact from person to person, here below, between a human being and God. In this contact that authorizes Val to articulate that which she had forbidden herself to name on preceding experiences, believing this was impossible, as she declares to Joe Bousquet, I quote, I made, the, I made the effort to love, but without believing myself with the right of giving a name to this love. Now she gives a name. It's Christ's name. Simone Weil finishes this text of her spiritual autobiography by making a confession to her friend, Father Perrin, that is both beautiful and terrible. She says, every time I think of Christ's crucifixion, I commit the sin of envy, end of quote. We can understand this better when we, we recall her journey. The movement of Trinitarian love, which finds its center in the personal encounter with Christ, who guides her to the love of the Father and to life in the Spirit, begins with an immersion in the Paschal mystery. This immersion configured itself by others' passion and the compassion that always tormented her heart. First the workers at the factory, then Christ in person, perceived in the midst of her suffering as a smile on a beloved face, in her own words. This Trinitarian dynamic redirects her towards the same Paschal mystery, center of the densest revelation of this personal and interpersonal God who enters into a relationship with God's creature, attracting her to communion and participation in the passion of the Son. Simone Veil died in England without being allowed to enter occupied France, as was her desire. She became weaker and weaker because she refused to eat more than her French compatriots were allowed to eat. This was the way she found to share the passion of her people. Now, I compare a little bit the two biographies. What if these two women had met each other? Simone Weil lived in New York during the war before going back to England, but she did not know of Dorothy Day. Yet, as one of these biographers comments, no person points more directly and prophetically to the significance of Dorothy Day's spirituality than does Simone Weil. In William Miller's book, All is Grace, uh, the author refers to a note of Dorothy Day uh, while in bed, recovering from a severe cold. I quote, to Dorothy Day writing staying in bed for a day, reading Simone Weil's essays. Very interesting on Languedoc civilization. Also her ideas on obedience. The concept is lost. There is no obligation of obedience. 
left except to the state, end of quote. It is undeniable that the spiritual commonalities they share make their biographies inspiring for today's world and church. The first and main commonality is their profound spirituality, inseparable from a deep awareness of the centrality of the other who suffers and is in need, and the imperative of justice and compassion toward them. In both of these women, faith and charity, praise and praxis, piety and solidarity, mysticism and ethics are absolutely integrated. This characteristic of their spiritual life can be recognized by some concrete aspects. Both Dorothy Day and Simone Weil showed in their very young years an extreme sensitivity for the poor, the afflicted, and the victims of any injustice. And this sensitivity was not only affective, but effective and concretely translated into a praxis that transformed peoples and structures. Questions like injustice and transformation of social structures were always present to Dorothy Day. In this sense, she has always been a pioneer and to some extent a prophet. For her, it was not enough to fight poverty effects. Poverty is an evil that has to be excised and for that society has to be transformed at its roots. Day's option for the poor and her struggle to create, together with the Moran, the Catholic worker movement was not simply a civic or political attitude. It was a spiritual one, the fruit of an honest and radical reading of the, of the gospel. And this was the spirit she wanted for the Catholic worker, the legacy of her life. In her own words, I quote, what right has any one of us to security when God's poor are suffering? What right have I to sleep in a comfortable bed when so many are sleeping in the shadows of buildings here in this neighborhood of the Catholic Worker Office. What right have we to food when so many are hungry or to liberty when so many labor organizers are in jail?" End of quote. Closeness and friendship with the poor as well as the spirit of poverty were likewise integral parts of Simone Weil's life since her earliest childhood. To get a sense of the significance of proximity and friendship with the poor in Weil's life, one need only to read the biography written by her friend Simone Petremont, together with her texts given to the Dominican priest Father Perrin before leaving Marseille for the United States during World War II. The importance of the spirit of poverty that she says very uh, simply and transparently to Father Perrin, I don't remember one single day in my life that I didn't have this spirit of poverty is expressed clearly in Vail's own spiritual biography, which is part of this manuscript. Vail's studies and professional life would merely give concrete form to those experiences. After passing her examination of aggregation in philosophy and being appointed to teach in Le Puy, uh, a city in the interior of France, teaching became one of Vail's many responsibilities. Because having already participated in the National Congress of the General Congregation of Labor, Simone Weil immediately sought out contacts with the trade union movement in which she participated actively. She joined the National Teachers Union and went on to organize meetings between militants of, of all political persuasion, fighting for unity within the trade union movement. In addition to her regular courses at the Lycée, she offered courses for free to the miners. Depriving herself of sleep and meals, she contributed to Alain's journal Le Faux and wrote articles for the Union bulletins. Her Union activity earned her trips to the police station, reprimands for educational authorities, and threats to transfer. The alliances that she made during this period were increasingly with the left, and even with the radical left. Veil's sympathies with anarchism were clear, but her crit and her criticisms of capitalism explicit. Nonetheless, she maintained her lucidity and her critical independence with regard to ideologies. Both Day and Veil vale were conscious that situations of injustice that resulted in poverty and unhappiness were not the will of God or a fruit of a blind destiny. They were a fruit of unjust structures, which it was necessary to fight and to change for that, politics was the legitimate and best way. 
Additionally, according to De Orville, it was not enough to struggle against poverty from the vantage point of an observer. They both believed it was necessary to experience, to go within the precariousness brought by poverty, feeling its effects from within. This was the only way to a deeper and truer solidarity with the poor, because it meant to embrace the same faith as them. They both felt called to be in communion with the poor in order to be able to help them to struggle and build their own liberation and freedom process. For Doherty Day, a real solidarity with the poor was essential for Christian commitment. I quote her, we need always to be thinking and writing about poverty. For if we are not among its victims, its reality fades from us. We must talk about poverty because people insulated by their own comfort lose sight of it. And maybe no one can be told, maybe that we will have to experience it. End of quote. According to Day, Jesus' life of solidarity with the poor is the example and the imperative for any Christian discipleship in the world. Her love for Jesus' person emphasized the humanity of Jesus, his life of labor as a carpenter, as well as the poor and outcasts with whom he chose to associate very closely. Jesus' preference for the poor was shared by her, and that was associate very closely. Uh, and that, that was the way she desired to configure the Catholic worker movement. She says, we felt a respect for the poor and destitute as those nearest to God, as those chosen by Christ to, for his compassion. Christ lived among humans. The great mystery of the incarnation, which meant that God became human, was that humans might become God. End of quote. The poor remain at the center of the Catholic worker movement's concern as it had been in the life and work of the founder, Dorothy Day, who focused her spirituality and testimony on them. She thought, while our brothers suffer, we must be compassionate with them, suffer with them. While our, bro our brothers suffer for lack of necessities, we will refuse to enjoy comforts. The concrete daily encounter, often with the poor, in the harsh and dreadful love about which Dorothy so frequently spoke, make her have very clear about the moral fragility and sinful condition of the poor, which was the same as all other human beings. She had no illusions about their virtue or the saintliness. That is why she wrote often about the bitterness of the poor, who cheat each other, who exploit each other, even as they are exploited who despise each other even as they are the despising. And is it to be expected that virtue and destitution should go together? No, she says, they are the destitute in every way, destitute of this world's goods, destitute of honor, of gratitude, of love. They need so much that we cannot take the works of mercy apart and say, I will do this one or that one work of mercy. We find they all go together. End of quote. Simone Weil also felt called to immerse herself in the life of the poor, and because of this she limited her political activity to intellectual work. In March of 34, she began to withdraw from partisan political activity. In a letter to her friend Simone Petremont, she writes, I have decided to withdraw entirely from any kind of political activity, except for theoretical work. This does not absolutely exclude possible participation in a great spontaneous movement of the masses in the ranks as a soldier, but I don't want any responsibility, no matter how slight or even indirect, because I am certain that all the blood that will be shed will be shed in vain and that we are beaten in advance. We can sense in this letter the sad lucidity of someone discouraged from the belief that party politics and violence could solve the problems that were afflicting Europe and the world. Without abandoning her engagement with the downtrodden and continuing to participate in strikes and mass movements, Vail began, de began developing ever more strongly within her the great project that would define her life to know the world of poverty and oppression from the inside, and she would then go to the factory. Veil's almost complete rupture with the political organization of the left did not imply, as we can see, an alienation from the reality of poverty and injustice. 
She remained convinced that one could combat injustice, getting, only getting close to it and leaving it from within. And that was her project to the factory. She once told a student, movingly, that, uh, I quote, above all, I feel that with the experience at the factory, I have escaped from a world of abstractions to find myself among real men, some good and some bad, but with real goodness and real badness. Goodness especially, when it exists in the factory, is something real because the least act of kindness calls for victory over fatigue and the obsession with payment." End of quote. Through his heart, this hard and deep experience of the factory, Simone Weil, like many other, just like many people after her, understood that the option for the poor would not be possible without this concrete and physical proximity to the life of them, to, her, to their suffering, their privations, and their longing for liberation. Both women felt this call to communion with the life of the poor, lived in the radical spirit of poverty as they did, developing special notions of what is and what should be human work. Dorothy Day, the activist, and Simon Weil, the intellectual, experienced and valued manual work as much as intellectual work. By their life and spirituality, the question of the idea apparently so clear in our times that physical work is less valued than intellectual work, and consequently, people who devote themselves to physical work are less valued than people who devote themselves to intellectual works is false. Dorothy Day and Simone Weil present a notion of manual work very distant from the elitist intellectualism that seems to dominate in our days. Both situate physical work at the center of their spirituality. Dorothy Day had helped her mother at home since she was a nine-year-old child. She washed dishes, helped her take care of her younger brother and clean home, and she took pleasure in it. As she writes, work was heavy, that is clear. Not always we could have been taken as a game, but it had to be done. And after some months of practicing, I was well used to do my part. Without knowing it, I had interiorized the philosophy of work, enjoying its creative aspects and obtaining intimate satisfaction for having done well a hard and boring work. Simone Weil believed that work in the best way to self-knowledge and the only one capable of establishing a valid form of social cohesion. She said, religion speaks of love, but the work creates respect towards human persons and equality. This is the reason for which collaboration in work creates long-lasting friendships to which there is no possible substitution. In what concerned their own vocation to work, it wasn't enough for Simone Weil to surrender her intellectual abilities and energies. She needed to feel her body, in her body, the mark and pain of her surrender. Manual work was her way. It was in the factory where she surrendered her body to fatigue, to pain, to hardships, to the point of feeling marked by the iron brand of slavery. Something similar happened to her in the farm and field work in the time of the war, where amid the fatigue of working the grape harvest on Gustave Thibon estate near Marseille, she experienced, experienced an intense spiritual consolation. She explains, this is this in clearly Eucharistical terms. My body's and soul's fatigue is transformed into nourishment for a people who are hungry. End of quote. Up to this point, we can we saw the convergences between those women. There are nevertheless deep divergences in the way they responded to their vocation and experienced their spirituality. Perhaps the greatest one is their relationship with the church. Dorothy Day was someone who managed to combine a progressive attitude toward the defense of human, social, and economic rights with a very orthodox and traditional sense of Catholic morality and pity. Her devotion and obedience to the church were neither blind nor uncritical. For example, she publicly condemned the Spanish phalangist leader Francisco Franco during the Spanish Civil War, thus incurring the opposition of many American Catholics, lay and clergy. And she had to change the name of her newspaper, Catholic Worker, ostensibly because the word Catholic implies an official church connection, but such was not the case, told her. 
They was a free woman, but she was a fervent and faithful Catholic too. The last thing she wanted was to quarrel with the church and to be apart from it. Because of this, she lived difficult moments when her conscience was confronted with the hierarchy's directions. She stood up, faithful and humble, but free. And that is how today this free woman is in the midst of a canonization process in the church she loved so deeply, but which also caused her much suffering. Simone Weil had a much more problematic relationship with the church. Despite her resistance to baptism and belonging to institutional church, she was a Christian. She wrote to Maurice Schumann, a friend of her, I adhere completely to the mysteries of Christian faith. Certainly I belong to Christ, at least I like to think so, but I am kept outside the church by difficulties of a philosophical order which I fear are insurmountable." Uh, end of quote. However, while recognizing her full Christian status, it is possible to say that she is a Christian in the way Christianity understands it. Once more, her own words can help us more than other source of information. God rewards the soul, Simon Weil says, that thinks of him with attention and love. And he rewards it by exercising a compulsion upon it strictly and mathematically proportionate to this attention and love. We have to abandon ourselves to that pressure. End of quote. Then, through this obedient passivity, they launched the great decisions and initiatives of her life such as working in the factory, joining the resistance during the war. Thanks to this loving passivity, which makes attention possible, she was able to recognize Christ's hold on her life and consent to it. In the name of that same obedience, she refused baptism because she did not feel that God asked it of her. Although she considered herself Christian, she studied many other religions, the Bhagavad Gita and um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which impressed the, her in a very special way. A philosopher trained in the Western tradition, she was very open and receptive to other philosophies and other cultures and other religions. They loved many things that were not part of Catholicism. She never wanted to abandon them because she believed God also loved them. This quote is very beautiful. All, I quote, all the immense stretches of past centuries, except the last 20, all the countries inhabited by colored races, all secular life in the white people's countries. In the history of these countries, all the traditions banned as heretical, those of the Manichaeans and Albigenses, for instance, all those things resulting from the Renaissance, too often degraded, but not quite without value. We could say then that Simone Weil was a Christian in the sense she belonged to Christ, but she stayed all her life at the door of the institution without entering it. Refusing baptism, she affirms not to be close to God, but waiting for God to show her his will at the precise moment where I will deserve that he imposes that to me. For her, obedience to God is more important than obedience to man or to an institution. But finally, Simone Weil was baptized by a Jewish friend, Simone Dietz, with water from the tap when she was almost dying, almost at the moment of her death, on her request and in full lucidity. Simone Dietz didn't tell that during many years by respect to her family. But finally, talking to a friend who admired Simone Weil very much, Georges Jourdain, he told her, you must tell because you'll die with the secret and it's not fair. People must know that she expressed this desire and that finally she had a ritual of baptism. Uh, many very orthodox people could ask, is this baptism valid? I think it is. <laughs> and maybe many people think too. So uh, the last part. With all the commonalities and deep divergences, it is undeniable that we can call Dorothy Day and Simon Weil pioneers because they anticipated by many years and even decades discoveries and decisions that the Catholic Church would make only at the occasion of the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. 
and which would find its most concrete expression in Latin America Church after the Conference of Medellin in, in 68. It is impressive to see how the, the spirit guided these two women, the activist and the philosopher, who had an experience and a desire transforming into a, into a decision and then into a practice taken up and lived during the 30s, three decades before. Dorothy Day founded the Catholic Worker Movement in the 30s. When it began, the most pressing concern was the massive unemployment and terrible poverty caused by the Great Depression. Since then, even if the challenges change in form and content, the movement continues to stand in faithful witness and solidarity with the least and marginalized in society through strikes, labor struggles, and protests for peace and prison reform. In Day's own words, these actions among the poor speaking up against war and injustice were equivalent to giving proof that the gospel could be lived. The Catholic worker movement wanted to leave radical Christian commitment in order to create a new society within the shell of the old. The aims of the Catholic worker movement are a critique of the unjust distribution of wealth, a critique of the political organization of the government, a critique of the distorted images of the human person caused by class, race, and sex, and the strong condemnation of the arms race. The means to achieve these ends are a personalist conception of human being, a decentralized society, nonviolence, the works of mercy, and voluntary poverty. The prophetic stance of Simone Weil happens through her intellectual reflection and her acute analysis of the reality of her time. The movement she made towards the factory in the 30s anticipated ideas that would take root only after one or more decades. Hers was a practice that would closely resemble one taken by some European lay persons in the 40s, the Action Catholique, that was a very powerful lay movement. These Christians who went into the factories to live with the poor and to proclaim the gospel descended into the underworld of the modern factory 10 years before the priest workers in the 50s. And yet, Simone Weil had her experience at the factory and felt what it meant to be a slave among the other slaves in the structures of modern work more than 10 years before all that. The Second Vatican Council gave those experiences legitimacy, especially in the Constitution Gaudium et Spes, a document that returned value to the affairs of the world. The document also gave value to all those new experiences that stimulated the church to go beyond, beyond their limits and encounter men and women, even in the most secular situations. Vatican II called the faithful back to the sources of her, their faith and to live their faith fully as a commitment for justice and charity. Recalling this ancient tradition in the middle of the 20th century, when the Catholics of the whole world were waiting for enlightenment in a climate of rampant secularization, Pope John XXIII defined the church as the church of the poor. Some years after the end of the council, we were being able to see its reception in the heart of Latin American church in Medellin. Meeting in Medellin, Colombia, the church, the bishops, stated that they no longer wanted to be a church that reflected orientations and priorities given by the churches of the north, especially the European ones, but a church that could be a source of new thoughts brought from the Latin American context. Vatican II had finished three years before and the reception in Latin American church for all that unexpected breath of spring that the council represented pointed in the direction of the poor. Anticipating what liberation theologians did many years later, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin combined a philosophy of right behavior with concrete action inspired by a the theology of incarnated love. Both movements, liberation theology and the Catholic work movement, do not separate faith and life, faith and praxis, spirituality and action. For Dorothy Day's Catholic worker movement and for liberation theology, it is impossible to proclaim the creed while not letting the needs of the poor challenge and question us. That challenge takes radical form in the option of the poor, which is not simply giving alms or giving away what ex exceeds our capacity of consuming old clothes, old food, old objects, dirty and dusty things. Dorothy Day, the Catholic Worker Movement and Liberation Theology are very clear that the whole of life should be transformed by the encounter with the poor. 
While dirty, they shaped all her life and action according to the needs of the poor, building houses of hospitality to shelter them, feeding them when they were hungry, and assuming the want and deprivation which were a consequence of that in her own life, liberation theologians formulated their reflection always around the need of structural transformation beyond the momentary assistance of someone needs. The political element is very clear to both movements. It is nevertheless important to stress that as they put the service to the poor at the center of their lives and action, they and the Catholic worker movement, as well as liberation theology, are not making a sociological or political choice only or mainly. They are making a theological choice, backed up by a serious theological reflection and by the whole history of the church. They affirm once more that it is necessary to opt preferentially for the poor because God did so. God revealed God's self as the God of the poor, the one who comes having heard the cries of the people in distress, the one who speaks and gives voice to the poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the one who lives God's divine privilege and comes to assume our vulnerable and mortal flesh, being obedient until death on the cross. The first motivation for both to opt for the poor is not to create a political party or concrete political structures. It is rather to do God's will and build God's kingdom. The changing of structures and transformation of reality is a consequence of that. Likewise, for Simone Weil, human suffering contains within itself a, cat a category that is something apart, specific and irreducible. Irreducible. Affliction. <laughs> Well considered this affliction, the great enigma of human life. The French word is malheur, very difficult to translate. Affliction is the most approximate translation in English, where in all the languages it's difficult to tra translate this valiant category malheur. This is because it is, I quote, surprising that God should give an affliction the power to seize the very soul of the innocent and to take possession of them as their sovereign Lord. Because affliction is something so radical and so structural, rendering those who have never experienced it incapable of comprehending the experience of the afflicted and rendering the afflicted incapable of helping anyone at all, they considered compassion for the afflicted a human impossibility, only a divine possibility. She says, when it is really found, we have a more astounding miracle than walking on water, healing the sick, or even raising the dead. For those who are genuinely compassionate, though, it's not a matter of giving material things, even things of vital necessity as food. She says, they do for the afflicted something very different from feeding, clothing, or taking care of them. By projecting their own being into those they help, they give them for a moment what affliction has deprived them of, an existence of their own. Here Vail goes on to identify charity and justice and to defend both as attitudes owed to the afflicted. And this, I believe, is where her thought is intertwined most closely with that of liberation theology. Vail writes that, I quote, Christ does not call his benefactors loving or charitable. He calls them just. The gospel makes no distinction between love of our neighbor and justice. We have invented the distinction between justice and charity. It is easy to understand why. Our notion of justice dispenses him who possesses from the obligation of giving. If he gives all the same, he thinks he has a right to be pleased with himself. He thinks he has done a good work, end of quote. Vail does understand the love of one's neighbor, the heart of the Bible message and of the gospel, purely and simply as justice. She says, I quote, only the absolute identification of justice and love makes the coexistence possible of compassion and gratitude on the one hand, and on the other, of respect for the dignity of the affliction in the afflicted a respect felt by the sufferer himself and the others. It has to be recognized that no kindness can go further than justice without constituting a fault under a false appearance of kindness." End of quote. 
Only the practice of justice then, according to Weil, can bring about equality between human beings, between the strong and the weak, the powerful and the afflicted. For the stronger party, the supernatural virtue of justice consists in conducting oneself exactly as if there were equality. For the weaker party, justice consists in not believing that there really is an equality of strength, in recognizing that the other's generosity is the only reason for this treatment. It is called gratitude." End of quote. Vail recognizes in a creature who acts in this way a reproduction of the original attitude of the creator and declares that this virtue is the Christian virtue par excellence. Like Vail, the liberation theologians believe that the relationship which liberates the poor from the poverty and the afflicted from their affliction is the one that is creative through its emptiness and renunciation and that does not give material things with which to satisfy immediate needs. It is rather the relationship that gives the afflicted the possibility of regaining their human dignity, of assuming fully their mission of transforming history and the destiny of the people. I conclude. Dorothy Day and Simone Weil lived in the past century, but their distance from us in terms of cultural context is not that big. They have been mystics at the frontiers, at the borders, and even at the margins of the, the, margins of the church. And nevertheless, they continue to be a powerful source of inspiration today. Their spirituality is countercultural and tell us that the experience of God is not something to appease us and alleviate the everyday stress of life. On the contrary, the experience of God is something to challenge us, to respond to the many questions and demands of our society and our church. In a culture seduced by pleasure and sensations, the mystical experience turns away from the self and allows one to be affected by others in their difference, their otherness, and their needs. Seduced by God, these two mystics, defenseless and without a way back, embark upon an adventure in which this seduction leads them to lose themselves in radical communion with the pain of the other, suffered by choice in their own flesh. In a culture that proclaims freedom as autonomy, accountable to no one and ruled by its image, most immediate desires while cultivating the arrogance of power, even at the cost of what truthfully belongs to others by right, their mystical experience is receptive and passive and above all aware of its impotence. In spite of being very active, theirs is a theopathic experience. These two women teach us that mystical experience is the primordial disposition of every human being. In a culture where power is glorified, the mystical experience teach us that human beings are patient even when they are agents, because they are incapable of producing anything at all by themselves, since they are unable to give themselves the being which makes them exist and which configures their identity. They receive everything. In an unjust culture where resources are distributed according to selfish and totalitarian manipulation by some to the detriment of others, where the well-being of some is achieved at the price of the progressive and systematic impoverishing of many, the mystical experiences of Dorothy Day and Simone Weil teach us to practice justice and to live according to its parameters. In a culture where injustice reigns, the mystical experience teaches us not to wish to be on the side of the conquerors, but rather on the side of the defeated, of the victims, and not to wish to enjoy the benefits of progress while so many are left without access to them. It teaches solidarity with the victims of injustice, sharing their condition and suffering the same injustice in one's own flesh. The spirituality of Dorothy Day and Simone Weil is a clear example of how to live intensely in the love of God and keep the attention turned unceasingly towards the place where the poor and the victims suffer and call out for justice. Love for God and love for justice cannot be separated anywhere the gospel is preached as good news. Thank you. Thank you.